So I'm here to talk about trademarks. Um, so I am a lawyer, which sometimes, in some instances where I speak, when I confess that I'm a lawyer, I hide behind the podium in case somebody wants to throw something at me. Um, how many people here are lawyers? Oh, a good number. And you outed yourself, too. How many people here didn't want to admit that they, no, just kidding. <laughs> and um, so, uh, yeah, so I am a lawyer, but the normal disclaimer is I am not your lawyer. And this is not legal <laughs> advice. <laughs> How many people came to this talk because they have a real pressing trademark issue that they want to get information about? Uh, so if you have a real pressing uh, issue you want to get trademark advice out, seek legal counsel. But hopefully you'll get some background from this talk, and it'll help you know what questions you should ask and how to get started. Um, so a little bit of background about me. Um, I, as I said, I have a legal background, and I was general counsel of the Software Freedom Law Center. But uh, then I left to go to one of my clients. So I was executive director of the GNOME Foundation. And now I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, which is the nonprofit home for over 30 free and open source software projects, many of which you've heard of, like Git, Samba, Wine, Inkscape. You will, we'll talk about a lot of these examples, because I, I draw on examples from our member projects. Um, but I do, I still do um, pro bono legal work for a number of different organizations, including questioncopyright.org, and I'm a cyborg. Um, how many people here have heard my medical devices talk? Okay, so just a few people. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, the very short version of this is that I have a heart condition that um, means that I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. It's like a 2 to 3% chance per year compounding, and I was diagnosed at age 31. So it was kind of crazy, and so I got a pacemaker defibrillator so that in the instance that I go into, the technical term is sudden death, <laughs> I can be shocked and, um, and it will be fine. Um, but when being told that I needed this defibrillator, I asked, what does it run? At which point, the medical device, <laughs> the representatives and the doctors had no idea what to tell me. And so after much research later, I realized things that everyone here probably knows, like software has bugs, it fails, and um, things here that I, I learned things that also might shock you, like, or well, not literally shock you, like my defibrillator, but, <laughs> but might surprise you, like, um, like the fact that the FDA doesn't actually review the source code on these devices. So the, the review level is low, and because the source code is closed, um, I have no confidence that the defibrillator that I have in my body will, is, will behave appropriately. And so I use that as a, as a jumping point to talk about how important software is to our infrastructure, how we're building all this infrastructure around free and open source software. And so this is my, my passion. And once you start talking about my life relies on free and open source software, then you can, it's a very easy connection to, you know, what about our cars? You know, the average luxury car has 100,000 um, lines of code, in, or more actually, uh, the, um, you know, to voting machines, to stock markets. Um, and, and, and from there, you sort of an internet of things where everything talks to each other. We're only as safe as our weakest link. All software must be free and open. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, so I'm a cyborg. That's a sort of my, my perspective and why I'm passionate about free and open source software and why you should be too. So um, how many people here know what a trademark is? So like, yeah, like a little bit over half of the room. Um, well done. It is, uh, trademarks are uh, brand management and, and identity, it's a brand. So um, you guys can't see this, but, uh, but like my computer has like a little logo on it, Zar Reason. Um, how many people here have heard of Zar Reason? Little, it's like a little laptop, not that many people. Uh, it's a, a little laptop manufacturer in the Bay Area. Um, so you'll see that a lot of companies put their brands on things, laptop makers in particular, so you can see their brand and you get recognition. And so a trademark is, you know, it's basically, it's like words or pictures. Um, it's, it's anything that identifies uh, the goods. And, um, and it's actually interesting. It's about uh, recognition. So we'll get into that a little bit more. But it's about what people think when they see your logo and brand are basically the tests for, for trademark. And it's earned through use. So it's not like, you know, in copyright, your trademark, in copyright, your rights are, are earned through the fixing of the expression of the tangible medium, right? In copyright, you earn, your, you earn copyright simply by writing the code that you're writing or, or creating the thing that is going to be copyrighted. It's intrinsic. You don't have to do anything. It's, it's born along with the thing that you fix. Um, whereas with trademark, you earn trademark as you use your brand and it's recognized in the field. So for example, the reason only, like I actually gave this talk in Germany last week, and nobody raised their hand. 
And I was sort of like, okay, well, see, they might not have a very strong trademark. You should all know about them, but they, you know, their mark is not very is not recognized and until it's recognized. So it's a really interesting thing. It kind of turns the legal analysis on its head, and it's a very different analysis than um, than copyright. So this is conservancy in all of our projects. Each of these logos and names, each of these is a trademark. So, um, so for example, um, you know, we're going to see, I'm going to use Git and Inkscape as examples. Um, so there, you have, um, the names can be trademarked. So, you know, if you, um, like Liberal has no logo to it, but the name itself is, is a mark. Um, and then some have, uh, have logos that they use, like, um, like this box is actually BusyBox. Um, but you might not know that from the, the, the logo, but it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. So you get, you know, but if someone were to use, use any of these, these marks to, be, you know, to use something else, uh, to imply something else, it could be a problem because it can be confusing. And we'll get into examples of that and why, why that's the case. But so I put up this slide in part because I want you to know what conservancy is about. And you've probably recognized, uh, you probably recognize some of these projects. You're probably using them. Even if you don't know and you're not sure you're using them, you're surely using them. <laughs> or the company you work for is using them. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, and there are a, a wide variety of marks and used in different places. So trademark is all about confusion. So, uh, you know, I was talking about before that trademarks are earned through use. You don't get a trademark for just thinking up the name of something, right? If you say, I want to call my laptop companies our reason, they should really pay me for this talk. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, so if you want to name your laptop companies our reason, if you get that idea, you don't just, your, your trademark is not automatically born. You can't just simply register a mark with the US Patent and Trademark Office and expect to get um, you know, recognition of that mark and protection from that mark. You earn that mark by using it, and it's all about the perception of consumers. Right? So it's all about what the, you know, what the, what the consuming public or, or whatever area that you're involved in thinks when they see your name or your logo or your product. And it's establishing that. And so this interesting uh, turning, turning the analysis on its head is intrinsic to, um, to trademark analysis. And no matter what issue you have, you discuss with trademark law, it's always going to come down to a question of, are people confused? You know, when they see your mark, does it bring certain, you know, is there, is there recognition? Do people know about it? And is it easily confused with something else? So what about all this, these weird marks and everything? What do those mean? So the R circle, because you see them all the time. You see them on everything, right? So the R in the circle means register. And what that mean, it means is that you have applied um, and registered your mark with the US Patent and, and Trademark Office, the USPTO, as I will say now, and it will roll off your tongue the more you talk about this. <laughs> and, uh, and the TM means just trademark. So, um, so with a registered mark, you need to have registered it, but there's a whole body of law, and it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but in the United States, there's a whole body of law where, um, whereby you earn common law trademark rights by using your mark. So even if you never register your mark, if you're using a name or a brand or a logo in business, you are earning, you, you are earning recognition. So just because someone hasn't registered their mark, it doesn't mean that they can't stop you from using the mark that you have, if, if it could be confusing. So, um, so that's basically, and, and what's good about using these, especially the TM logo, is that it's shorthand, it's, it can be small, and it tells people, this is a brand, I'm using it, just so you know, you know, it's not just a, it's not just a word that you can use. Um, so there's an inherent tension between trademark law and, uh, and the enforcement of trademark law and, and the ideals of free software. How many people here have heard of Ice Weasel? So Ice Weasel. So not that many people actually, like maybe like a quarter of the audience, I would expect it to be higher, but Ice Weasel was, um, it is a, um, it's a fork of Firefox. And it came about because uh, the Debian community felt that the Mozilla trademark policy around Firefox was too restrictive. And the idea behind free and open source software is that you know, anyone should be able to distribute the software 
modify it, distribute those modifications at will, provided that you know, they, they satisfy the terms of the licenses. And those may have different requirements depending on what license you choose. Um, and so the, the Debian perspective was if we can distribute it and call it Firefox, then we actually can't distribute it. You know, basically, the trademark logo was so restrictive that they felt like they, they, it was not fully free. And therefore, in order to be able to package it with, with Debian Free, they, uh, the, some of the community forked the project and, um, you know, and called it Ice Weasel as like a little joke on Firefox. Uh, and, and in that time, Mozilla amended their trademark policy. They became a lot clearer about that. And, um, and I think at the same time, the Debian community got a little bit of education about trademarks. And so uh, it was a really interesting situation. But as someone who represents free and open source software projects, it's very hard to find the right balance between giving permission to allow people to do what they should do under free software licenses while still having some control over the logos and trademarks. So we draft a lot of trademark policies. How many people have read a trademark policy? This is really getting into it. Oh, hey, okay. like the same quarter that heard about Ice Weasel. I think you all, <laughs> you all heard about Ice Weasel and went and read the policies. <laughs> OK, so, uh, so Ice Weasel, so sorry, Pol trademark policies are something that you put in place that give clarity to people as to what they can use their trademarks for, your trademarks for, and what they can't. I highly recommend if you are in a free software project and you are establishing a brand, and you are establishing a brand by simply using a name consistently with your software and using it to promote your free software project, um, that you adopt a policy that clearly sets out what you expect people to want to do and uh, you know, what you expect people to be able to do and what you expect them to ask for permission to do. And, um, and we'll get a little bit more in detail about that. This is the, um, the Git trademark policy that we put in place. And it, it's basically the similar policy. I, actually, the first one that I, uh, I started writing like this was, uh, was Subversion. Uh, and you'll see sort of, uh, so a, lot of, a lot of trademark policies are of a similar model. And it sort of talks about the, the purpose and then talks about um, the things that you can do. I think I have a slide that, yeah. It, it talks explicitly like what you can do and what you can't do. Um, like for example, if you've got substantially unmodified versions, you should be able to call it by the name of what it is. Um, and, uh, and then naming conventions, because sometimes this is quite confusing. So for example, um, you know, putting the name of the project in another product like, for example, for example, Git foo, I mean, or, or Git plus, or different Git, just, just as a, <laughs> um, you know, uh, Git fantastic, or <laughs> um, if you see where I'm going with that. Um, you know, some th sometimes it could be permissible, sometimes it couldn't. Usually in a policy, you want to make the policy that you can't do that without permission. You can't use the name in a whole other name as a, as a portmanteau, or as anything like that. Um, and you want, to, want someone to have to ask for permission. And specifically saying what is and what isn't allowed um, is very, very helpful. Um, merchandising, for example, you want to think very clearly about whether you want to allow it or not. Now, a business view, a corporate view of free and open source software might lead you to say, we don't want anybody using our logo for merchandising. If there's going to be t-shirts with our logo, they better sure come, well, come from us, right? But if you're a free and open source software project, building a diverse community that has multiple companies getting involved, if you have a diverse project, you might want to consider actually allowing people to make t-shirts because actually it's quite good promotion for the project. The more people walking around with your logo on their shirt, the more times people will have a recognition of what you're doing, they might go and see what you, you know. What, so it's, it's not necessarily a straight line and our projects come out on different sides of the issue on this. So for example, um, I was recently, uh, like six months ago, executive director of the GNOME Foundation. Um, GNOME has a, a little bit of a tighter policy because um, it's a very design oriented community and they want to make sure that the designs look good. Um, and so, all of these things are, are either allowed or, or not allowed. And the things that are allowed under these policies are only allowed to the extent that there's no likelihood of confusion, which is what all of the trademark law analysis comes back to. And so from my perspective, as a lawyer that wants to promote freedom, 
I don't want to limit, I want to make sure that I'm, my catch-all is within the letter of the law, right? Is within what is, you know, with the, the legal limits. I don't want to permit anything that's going to have likelihood of confusion without having a very serious thought about it, about the positives and negatives, and really evaluating how it's going to affect the brand and the trademark. Yeah. With respect to merchandise, do you usually put restrictions on them? Like you can't, you, you can't couple it with profanity or you know pornography or stuff like that. I mean, you see that typically with commercial companies. Yeah. So usually not. Um, most free and open source software projects come from a very strong free free speech component, and so they want to encourage. Um, people to say what they want to say. There are things like we don't limit, um, you know, generally specifically say you can talk about it factually, even though you don't need to, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that, um, about called nominative use. Uh, but as far as you know, being uh, there are some uh, anti-disparagement clauses in some of the free software um, trademark policies. I have personally have a little bit of a mixed view about them. I think they have very limited legal effect. Because if you're being critical of a brand, then you probably have a right to use it in that way anyway, under free speech laws in the US. So, yeah? So the TM is just putting people on notice. It's just telling people that uh, that the, the you are claiming some trademark rights for it, and it, it serves as a notice. So if somebody violates it later, it will be harder for them to say, "Oh, I didn't know that this was a trademark. I thought it was just descriptive of what you were, you know, of what you were creating." Is there a common this is great. understanding Thanks. or expectation that if you use the little TM? You have registered it, or is are those two orthogonal? Right. So if you're using the R in a circle, you have you registered. have registered it. TM, you may have registered it. So, but there's no expectation you have. Right. But there are common law trademark rights that arise from using the mark that you could put, you could use to. And I, and I have um, I have as a lawyer helped projects get um, bad actors to cease and desist based on com, you know based on common law. Um, trademarks, and um, and helping to register a mark can be easier if you can show that there's a you know that common law trademarks have been um, included. So we get all kinds of crazy requests for the use of our marks. It's amazing. I mean, things you would normally expect like stickers, um, academic papers where people want to mention the projects that are in conservancy, um, you know, use on websites, domain names. Um, even project names, even company names. And then some other crazy stuff like, uh, and I have to be careful now because uh, I'm being videoed, so I can't give all of my colorful examples. <laughs> so come talk to me after if you want some colorful examples. <laughs> but like but for TV, like uh, sitcoms that wanted to use logos in the backgrounds, um, artists who might want to incorporate documentary. Like it's really like the, it's fascinating. And, um, and we live in a, um, in a, in a permission asking culture. So even though you can make a very generous policy, even though you can specifically explain that your, your mark is, is valid. And actually, um, several of Conservancy's marks, like, um, you know, like it, like Inkscape, uh, those are, the logos themselves are actually licensed under a free license like LGPL. Uh, and GNOME as well. Um, and really interesting things happen with that. Trademark lawyers that are to come out of like traditional trademark law totally freak out when they see that logos are are um, are released under f uh, free licensing. And so it's really really interesting. And I'll show you an example of that. But even though some like there may be explicit permission to use these logos, a lot of people ask us, and um, and they, while they don't have to if it's within the policy, it's really fun sometimes that they do because you can see what they're using it in. Um, so there's this concept of, you know, of defending your mark. And there is legal basis in the um, assertion that if, if you don't defend, if you don't protect your mark from, um, from use by others or misuse, that you will lose your, your trademark. But that is vastly over the secret between us secret on video, uh, the secret, is that, the secret is, that, is that this is vastly overstated a lot of times by corporate departments in order to, um, to zealously protect a brand. Um, and they rely on, the, um, on the, uh, the part of trademark law that says that if you, don't, um, if you don't protect your brand, that you will lose it. Now, there are, there's really interesting things, fun things, like um, in trademark law that I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, like, um, like concepts like genericide. Who here has heard of genericide? 
Okay, so the same people who are reading the trademark policies. <laughs> so genericide is, this, uh, is basically what happens when your brand is so widely used that it becomes synonymous with the thing itself, right? So like, um, you know, uh, Kleenex. Kleenex was a good example. Coca-Cola, right? So around the U.S., there are parts of the country. I don't know if this is one where, is this part of it where, where if you ask, order a Coke, yes. you, you, they'll say what kind. Okay. Yep. So Coke at one point was hiring like college students to go out and to go into restaurants and to order a Coke. And when they were asked, what kind would you like? They'd say, no, I want Coca-Cola Coke. This is what I'm talking about, right? And so, um, and there are, this is like a, so trademark, the area of trademarks is kind of like a, a living and breathing and ever changing thing. So for example, my mother will talk about Googling something on Yahoo. She will. She will. Sometimes I joke and I say, I'm, I'm going to Google it on DuckDuckGo. <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> and so, and so like, these things are, are and, and so there is some, um, some truth to this, but it's a little bit overstated that you sometimes need to do. So here's an example. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is a tattoo parlor in Bangalore in India, and it's called Inkscape. <laughs> and Inkscape is the design software that is a member of the Software Freedom Conservancy. It says, create the tattoo you'll love forever. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, concerned citizens were walking by the day they put this signage up. This is brand spanking new. And, and sent us the picture and said, you got to stop this because they're using our mark, we are Inkscape, and they're using this trademark. And so we thought about it, and you know, we have very limited resources. Are these, is this something that we're going to really pursue? Well, there are a lot of limitations on how much you can claim in trademark law. And one of the limitations is a geographic one. And this can play out in really interesting ways. So the first thing we did was we went online, and we went to see you know, like what online presence does this, you know, does this tattoo parlor have? Are they, you know, are they, do they have this big online presence? Are they like, you know, giving design services around tattoos? They have basically no online presence. They have a Facebook page, which has very little on it. It's, uh, it's amazing. They're, they're basically just totally an in-person shop. Will someone who walks by this tattoo parlor get confused with Inkscape the project? Probably not. Now, if they change their model and they become more present online, if they're offering to design your tattoo using software, you know, basically you're limited for, you're limited geographically, but you're also limited as to, you know, the, the area in which you're active. So, you know, our projects are software projects. So will the tattoo parlor be confused with the software project? Probably not. This becomes very low priority to us if the, you know, inks, if you want your, you know, the Inkscape people want to give tattoos. I hope they look good. <laughs> I hope you are happy forever with them, right? Um, this is the Samba Cafe in New Jersey. I hear their grilled salmon is killer. <laughs> um, again, Samba is a good example. Samba as a word is not distinctive to software, right? It's a, it's a, it's a name that can be used in different contexts. You might think of it in terms of music or dance, uh, but it's distinctive when it's applied to software. Having it in a restaurant is a completely different situation. Similarly, Boost, right? It's a great C++ libraries, but, uh, but in terms of energy drinks, it's, you know, it, I, I doubt anyone would be, would be confused. Um, and, uh, and Sugar Labs has sugar on a stick. And you're limited in terms of what you can protect for trademarks and uh, you know, and, and like, you, you know, for example, Apple Computer can't stop people from describing apples as apples, right? You can only use it. And so Sugar Labs, when they have sugar on a stick, which is the um, sugar installations on USB, which is awesome because it means you can bring it into schools and use the computers that they have already, you know, is not confusing with um, like this sh sh literally sugar on a stick. So one of my favorite examples is, uh, is one that came across when I was at the GNOME Foundation, an executive director of GNOME. So you can see GNOME uses the TM, um, even though their mark is registered uh, because it, uh, it, it looks good. <laughs> and also, um, you know, and it's small. And, uh, and they use it because uh, in different jurisdictions they might not be registered. Does anyone know what this is? Oh, it's a little dark in, this, in the, the screen. Those fish that... Uh... Yeah, this is a fish pedicure. So this is a fish pedicure. I heard a negative, but some people love it. It's actually, it's not, um, it's outlawed in certain parts of this. So the, the fish pedicure is there are these, these like cleaning fish that, uh, 
that uh, eat your, the dead skin off your feet. So you, so I've never done one, so I don't know. But you put your feet, your feet in the water, and then the fish just eat all the dead skin. And it's apparently like some people love it because it makes their skin soft and new, and, and they love it. And they, the, the fish just eat, are only interested in the dead skin. Uh, and so, uh, and it's outlawed in some parts of the country because they weren't keeping the fish in good conditions, and they weren't cleaning the water, and really yucky. But, uh, but okay, so somebody contacted the GNOME Foundation when I was executive director because they were using our logo. <laughs> Isn't that cool, right? right? So, so they used the GNOME logo, but they made it look like a fish. They added an extra toe, right? Now, so somebody, so the reporter was like, outrage, they're using our logo, let's stop them. However, so you go back to the normal question of, is this likely to be confusing? Not really, but what I love about this is this is the perfect example of how you can have benefit to freely licensing your logo while still protecting your trademark. So these logos, while you can see side by side that they're from the same, uh, from, from the same, you know, from the same uh, source file, you can also see that the fish logo looks completely different. If you weren't seeing them side by side, you wouldn't necessarily think of the GNOME logo unless you were intimately involved with the GNOME project. They change the color, they change the, uh, plus it's describing something that's completely out of the area, but they had an advantage because they could use a file that was LGPL'd for their logo. So this is one of the few, like one of the best examples of how you can have benefit of freely licensing your logo under copyright while still having it be consistent with your trademark policy. On the other hand, this logo, <laughs> this is a, the Debian swirl with the GNOME footprints. And this happened like not too long after the fish pedicure where I was like, yes, a good example of how it's great to, you know, how we can share and we can use trademark law to, you know, to help people without having to, you know, still keep our trademark, uh, but without having to interfere. Um, and so this is a, so uh, this was basically a logo that was created in order to show that it was a distribution of Debian with, uh, with GNOME on it. And there was a lot of like disagreement and ultimately, um, and, and actually the GNOME Foundation was, was, was uh, accused of not releasing their, um, their logo freely um, and, and there were reminders of the Ice Weasel incident. But, um, however, uh, you know, upon closer look and discussion with the Debian community, um, it, was, it became clear that actually um, nobody really liked this logo and it could be confusing and that in fact the Debian community didn't want to be confused any more than the GNOME community did. And so while we could use some logo like this in the future, we should probably talk about it. So having a pragmatic approach towards copyrights is a really great way to go. And the, what, the, the kind of analysis that you need to do for these things is sort of, are, are the marks similar? Is it, are, you, are you in a different market? Um, you, know, like the, you know, like the Inkscape Tattoo Parlor or Samba Restaurant. Um, the overall impression, so this is where the fish pedicure situation was very helpful because the overall impression of the use was totally different. And was anyone actually confused? Did anyone go in to the uh, tattoo parlor and say, can you give me a copy of like, Inkscape software? <laughs> or in the fish pedicure space to say, you know, I want to tell you about GNOME 3. <laughs> um, and uh, you, know, what, you have to evaluate what is the actual impact going to be in the community and also realize that while, so uh, who here has heard of fair use? Like everyone, I hope. Yeah, pretty much everybody. Um, so, uh, so fair use is, is a concept under um, copyright law. The um, analog to this in trademark law is, um, is called nominative use. And it's basically when you're be making a descriptive um, reference to, uh, to a product. And so that we want to be able to allow as much as possible. And that gets us pretty far. And the analysis might be different under different conditions. So it's really interesting. So I had this long conversation with a trademark lawyer at a company about uh, something where, um, where I, as a nonprofit executive director and counsel, had one set of interests, and she in a company had it, but it was the same issue, is that we were making the same decision together. And we go through the analysis, we talk about the same case law, we talk about the entirely the same legal analysis, and 45 minutes later, we get to the end of the discussion where we, yes, 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 and I said, great, so we can do it. And she says, 
great, so we can't. <laughs> and it's basically that you're, you're, you have to sort of think about what your goals are and what you're trying to accomplish. And a lawyer with the interest of a company at heart might come to a different conclusion than a lawyer who is based within the, um, the nonprofit side of the project. So you have to sort of keep that in mind. Um, and it's really important to th keep your goals in mind and sort of evaluate what you're hoping to get out of trademark protection. How many people here have heard of GAME? OK, so like maybe like a third. GAME was, uh, you know, uh, how many people have heard of Pigeon? Many more people, right? GAME was Pigeon. And, uh, or Pigeon was GAME. <laughs> and, uh, and the AOL said, hey, we are AIM. We don't feel comfortable with you as game. And as their lawyer, I started working on a defense. Right? I started working on, you know, well, we've been using this for all this time. It's a play on the word game, you know, G-A-M-E. And the I-M is at the end. It's not about aim. It's about instant messaging. And then we took a step back and said, what are we trying to accomplish from this? Is this a brand that's worth protecting? You know, did you think a lot about game when you chose it? I know you have a lot of, it was a very popular project, but do you think people would stay with you if you change the name? And they decided to rebrand it and come up with a different name. And Pigeon is actually a great name for an instant messaging. And they, they came up with a whole, um, you know, with a, uh, a logo, and it's a really well-integrated brand. They're so much better off having changed their brand than they would have been had they just kept, uh, had they fought AOL and tried to keep it. Um, so all this trademark work, and ooh, I'm going over, so I'll go a little bit faster. All this takes a lot of work. This is, um, so this is uh, Tony Sebro, who's uh, Conservancy's general counsel, and Pam Chestick, who's local to the area and a fantastic trademark lawyer who's independent. She gives us some pro bono work and is really amazing. They, uh, they work quite hard on our behalf. And we just won a, um, an opposition proceeding with the US Patent and Trademark Office where a, um, a company was trying to use one of our project's names in their company name and their product name and we were able to stop them. Um, and there are a lot of similar areas that we've been able to clear up. Um, how many people have heard of Gitip? Gitip, like, yeah, okay. It was like a, uh, it, meant, it was originally meant to be like a, like a tip jar alongside GitHub, uh, but it sort of wound up being like a, a small like micropayment, and uh, they recently rebranded, and the founder uh, wrote this great post about why they decided to rebrand, and you know, he, he, so they were Gitip and they became Gratipay. And he said, you know, it's hard to spell, hard to, Gitip is hard to spell, hard to pronounce, and hard to remember. And for Pete's sake, my own kids confuse Gitip with GitHub. And, they, uh, and this is a drawing that his son did at school <laughs> of what his father, like inspired by his father's work. And so his own child could not remember the name. And so, and so he mentions the, the confusion with GitHub because it's a two syllable beginning with Git, and also the fact that, you know, that Conservancy and the Git team is protecting their mark as the reasons why they have changed and moved away. And I think this is a very good result because at the end of the day, you want a good brand for your product that people will recognize. And if you come too close to other names, and um, you know, it, it just gets confusing. Uh, Conservancy has agreements in place with GitHub and a couple of, uh, you know, one or two of the other um, uh, uses of Git in the name, and that make, controls the situation. And the the choices of who is allowed to use the Git mark is a you know is a controlled um, thought about thing, as opposed to something that you you know you just uh, allow to happen, which doesn't doesn't help anyone. Uh, this is uh, these are pictures from the Evergreen conference. Uh, Evergreen is library software, um, and there are like a totally awesome community. Uh, librarians are so cool. <laughs> And they're like a kind of a different free software community. And so uh, at their conference, um, so this, this, this picture I really like a lot because it's, uh, he said that he thought the conference room looked like the UN. And he was like, librarians, take over the UN. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, but so uh, at their conference, a third party started advertising for an event that was nearby. And they called it Evergreen because it was a third party service that was proprietary software. And they use the evergreen name to get people who are going to the conference to go to their event. And using, because evergreen has a trademark and we, trademark council and conservancy, they were able to prevent that from happening. And there are a lot of times where this happens where people use the name of a project to do all kinds of terrible, like to basically direct, pro, direct um, traffic to proprietary software projects, which are antithetical to the very core values of the projects that are uh, part of our free and open source software community. Um, so 
there are a lot of bad situations that happen in um, relation to trademarks. A lot of people have heard about um, a company, like uh, consulting companies that form around a piece of software and, uh, and then the resultant uh, use of that name in the company project, even though it was not the understanding of the, um, of the group when they started out. They thought they were participating in a neutral free software project, and all of a sudden it becomes a consulting company. This happens all the time. Most of the disagreements that we encounter happen uh, from that. And so we at Conservancy have been thinking about how to prevent these situations um, before they occur. And uh, I don't think I have a slide. Yeah. So what, we're, so what we've started to do is we're, um, I'm pre-announcing, which I always hate to do, <laughs> but, but we're, we're, um, we're putting in a starter kit, so sort of something in place before you need a foundation, you need stewardship of your name and your mark. And so we're, we're creating this service where you can simply register your name with us. It's actually quite complicated under trademark law, so it's taking a lot of work to put the agreements in place. But, um, but the idea is that it's a very lightweight thing, and you might not ever need that trademark enforced, but at least you make a statement with your free software project. You say, I want there to be um, you know, a neutral perspective for participation in my project. This name will never be used by, uh, by any one company to exert control over that company. And, um, and I think it will be a helpful way. And then it has other benefits, like, we'll, uh, like if you do decide you want a foundation, you can jump the queue in, uh, in applying to Conservancy, which is often, um, we often have a backlog of applicants. So um, anyway, so that's something that we're working on and I hope to make an announcement about soon. So how important are trademarks? Sometimes they're very important. Sometimes they help prevent misuse and abuse Sometimes they can help keep the, the ideals of a community focused on their free software project. Um, and sometimes they get in the way. Sometimes, you know, in the interest of sharing, it might be better to, um, to not focus on your trademark. It's really important to stay goals oriented and to use the legal mechanisms that you have at your disposal to, you know, to end those goals. And at the end of the day, you may want to increase participation more than you want to um, defend any particular mark. But there's no substitute for having you know, a strong brand that people recognize and that gets people excited about your project. So very lawyerly, I will end with a, it depends. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but unfortunately, that is the case. Um, both uh, Gnome and Conservancy are charitable organizations, and uh, you should donate if you can. And so I think I have, we have, we have yes, we have five minutes. I was like rushing to get to questions. So questions. Do you think there's a correlation between vigorous trademark protection and open source projects which are under a permissive license as compared to not so much and uh, you know uh, projects with copyleft? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I think actually it's quite varied. I mean, mm -hmm. so, so it's, it's interesting because I think that that projects are permissive for a number of different and copyleft for various reasons. Right. And, um, and those reasons can be to, um, so a project might go as a permissive license because uh, they have a feeling that the companies that are involved in the space would be more amenable to um, a permissive license. And sometimes they're, um, you know, the companies are, uh, are pressuring towards a permissive license. But sometimes there are people, there are actually a lot of people who believe that a permissive license is more fully free than a copyleft license. And that sometimes impacts how these trademark issues also play out. So you know, if you go to a BSD conference, you know, it's, it's really interesting how, how people feel about it and the, the desire to share amongst uh, permissive, you know, permissive communities can be extremely strong. Right. And so I think that it sometimes varies depending on that. Yeah, I, I just, the reason why I ask is I, I think that you know, in general, the more permissive the license, the more likely there will be external companies consuming your software mm -hmm. and wanting to leverage that brand awareness from the open source company, whereas it's not that easy doing that with, for example, GPL code for a company that... Uh, yeah, I don't, think that, I don't think that that's true, actually, because I think that uh, the copyleft projects like the Linux kernel are so widely used in so many different companies, and it, you know, and people assert the trademarks differently. So I'm not sure that I see those, um, those issues. I, I, I also would like to give a talk about misunderstandings around copyleft and why you might want to choose copyleft licensing. And we would probably have it quite, uh, have a long discussion about that if we had that panel. But, uh, but yeah, but, uh, but anyway, so uh, who else has a question? Yeah. 
Well, so there's an agreement um, in place between Git and GitHub. So it's, you know, so that's, that's in a different category. Okay. Yeah. So all work is considered copyrighted upon being placed in the fixed medium, right? So if I make a logo mark and it's got art, it doesn't matter if I ever protect it as a trademark, because if you use it, you, I could go after you on copyright, right? That's right. So Before that sort of cre- legal IP protecting kind of person. Well, cr- right. So creating a logo um, with artwork, fixing that expression in a tangible medium, you have copyright around the um, the logo in the same way that the um, you know that the Inkscape mark or or uh, GNOME, since we use that as an example, is is licensed. The copyright is licensed under LGPL. So there is so you can there are all kinds. So software is quite complicated, right? Because we have all these different legal regimes that basically govern the rules around software, and none of them were invented for software, and they're all awkwardly applied in layers, right? We've got patents and copyright and trademarks, and and it's just basically, it all stacks up quite awkwardly, and despite the fact that there have been some revisions that deal with software, I don't think it's a very good legal regime for software overall. And so it's quite problematic, and this is one of those areas where yes, you can use copyright to stop people from using your logo, but they can still use the name. There's no copyright on the name unless there's, there could be copyright on a special font that you've printed the name in, certain kerning or whatever. So there, are, there could be copyright around letters and fonts and things like that. But, um, but in our world, we wouldn't want to do that anyway because we would want to, you know, right. we would, we would want to be, we would want to share. And, and more importantly, if people are distributing software, we want them to refer to our project. But we also want to recognize the fact that, you know, we want them to say if they've modified it that it's based on this software or that it's a derivative of this software. Because if they make changes and they, then there's a, a, a real quality issue, right? Like, what, what is it that I'm downloading? And um, a lot of big projects like um, LibreOffice and um, Firefox and Thunderbird have had really good examples of people making really malicious changes, changes that have you know, malware in them or, um, or other problems using the, the goodwill of the Mozilla logo and of the, you know, the LibreOffice logo, and that's really problematic. And then you really need trademark to help shut those things down because it's predatory behavior and it's not good for anyone. Okay. Sorry, then you. <laughs> um, have you ever noticed or encountered an instance where uh, a free license that's sort of copyright, I guess, could uh, or has led to uh, the evolution of the logo itself? Like somebody took the logo and did like some fan art or whatever, but that was eventually merged back into the original logo? Has that ever yeah, I mean, that definitely happens all the time where people who are involved in the community think the logo stinks. Um, I'm going to actually go back to this slide and say, so some of these logos have been improved by, uh, by users um, of the software because they, you know, they saw the logo and they wanted to improve it. Some of our logos could really use stand to be improved. So if anyone here <laughs> wants to, like, you can. I'm not going to mention, not going to mention any particulars, but but some of them are like pixelated, and they we don't have. Good, if you if you want to do that, you should, <laughs> and then just to get in touch with us, and we'll, it'll become part of the formal process. And so you know, all these things we want to establish, just like free and open source software, we want to improve them with the community participation. Um, so with copyright, we have Creative Commons. Does trademark have a similar? Thing. What we do have are the policies that um, I started working on when I was at the Software Freedom Law Center, which um, which our you know conservancy projects have, and a few other projects have that um, that I help. So we've got good policies that basically are as permissive as we think are appropriate with free software, while still holding back. They're not in the same like hack on trademark law the way that copyright is a hack. You know, copy left is a hack on, on copyright law, but they're sort of like. You know, they're 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 basically just set the rules and they let you um, do what you want to without worrying about it too much. So is it sort of sort of like Creative Commons, but without the fancy you know branding that has been created around it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I it's I I think that it's just basically a, a, the policies are a way to share, um, you know, a way a way to have. A clear sharing or holding back of materials, uh, you know, of a logo in a way that benefits everyone. It's not. Um, I don't think it lends itself quite as much to the, you know, Creative Commons approach. There are efforts to make standard trademark policies, and and some of those are quite good, and um, and I encourage people to um, to look at them. But you know, trademark policies each each. 
project that has its own culture has different um, has different needs and different goals, and you have to decide what you want for your you know for your project and your logo. Um, anyway, I think we are out of time, and thank you all so much for attending and listening.